Well, thank you so much for being here on a Friday afternoon, no less. Uh, thank you so much to Jimena and to Jessica and to the uh, institution that has uh, brought me here today. I'm delighted to be here. So uh, I think it's more of a merit that you are here than I am. But uh, <laughs> uh, nonetheless, thank you so much. So earlier today, we had, as uh, Jimena mentioned, we had a uh, workshop on uh, Spanish specifically and how uh, cognitive linguistics can inform the teaching of the actual teaching in an actual classroom of uh, Spanish as a foreign language. Because if you are familiar, and I'm sure you are, with second language acquisition and uh, its applications to language teaching, you'll know that a lot of the researchers don't teach themselves. So, um, and, and, and it's a difficult topic. Uh, to cover and it, uh, it creates a gap between researchers and, and practitioners and, and teachers. So uh, it is an advantage to be able to be a linguist and a teacher of language at the same time. And um, I believe that cognitive linguistics is an approach to or has an approach to language teaching that is very, very productive, that can be applied productively in the classroom. And um, having the opportunity to do the research myself or to organize a research study myself um, is sort of what brings me here today. And uh, the talk is called Mind and Body in Space, which is actually the title of the course on cognitive linguistics that I teach at Columbia University. But um, what I wanted to uh, present here today is a little bit of a uh, empirical a study um, that is part of an empirical project on uh, cognitive linguistics approaches to language teaching that focuses on the difference uh, between the imperfect and the predatory in the Spanish classroom. So the motivation for this study is that um, if you know, if you're familiar with Spanish, you know that the imperfect and the predatory is one of the, I guess, top five difficulties in the, in the language classroom. And it is very, very, um, it's very complicated for the students, especially if they don't have that duality in simple tenses in the past in, in their own language. And uh, traditional instruction usually is based on what's called puzzle combinations with uh, temporal markers. So with things like yesterday, you will learn that the preterite must be used. Or with things like um, every summer in the past, you will learn that the imperfect should be used when in actuality that's not true at all. Uh, it just works really well for the exam. But um, with these approaches, they're notional and functional. They have disconnected uses. They're taught separately. Um, and you, the imperfect, you get the imperfect with their temporal markers on one, the one hand, and then you get the preterite with their temporal markers on the other hand, and then you compare the two of them. But students never get to see um, what similarities are there. They only get to see the differences, and that's not very productive. Uh, so there's also a scarcity of empirical studies testing the possibilities of a cognitive linguistics approach to teaching grammar, especially in uh, any language that's other than, than English. And we were just talking right now that um, cognitive linguistics is a fairly young discipline that um, emerges at the end of the 1970s. But it's not until the late 1990s that cognitive linguistics intersects for the first time in a productive manner with um, language teaching and second language acquisition. So we're talking about 20 years um, of contact between disciplines that in terms of um, research and in terms of empirical research and published research and this takes forever, as you probably know, um, there's not a lot. So uh, empirical studies that work on traditional approaches and uh, cognitive linguistics based approaches that we know of, there's just five. Uh, and pretty much by the same author over there, Blanca Palacio Alegre. Um, there's not a lot. For, uh, for other forms and other languages other than English. So um, here we come. We're going to try to uh, you know, give something back to the field. Uh, so that is the motivation for, uh, for this kind of study. So here, in a, if we want to do second language pedagogy that is informed by a linguistic theory, in this case um, cognitive linguistics, we are going to take a look at um, what cognitive linguistics says about the past in general. So um, to do L2 pedagogy in publications in the field of SLA and cognitive linguistics recommend that, first of all, explicit grammar instruction be taught in the classroom, um, and also that focus on form. 
um, issues because we find that um, from a psycholinguistic point of view, focus on form as a methodology really helps the students uh, focus on making form meaning connections, and that's what we want. So um, that is for the classroom, and then um, we work with the concept of prototypes, which comes from uh, categorization studies and, and pro prototype studies in cognitive linguistics, which we talk about as target forms that have a core meaning. Uh, so these target forms, we take for the past or for the imperfect or for the predator, you look for the main central use. And then from there, you sort of extend uh, meanings from there. And what you try to do is find a pattern of use and account for all uses based on one principle, which would be the prototype. And that is uh, made by using, applying the metaphor of time and space and not considering time when talking about tenses, um, which in English sounds better than, uh, than in Spanish because in English you have time and tense. In Spanish you only have tiempo, which accounts for both. So it's really confusing. It can be really confusing. So by using, in, within a prototype, using the metaphor of time and space and using the perspective as a... Um, as a um, empirical, technical, theoretical concept, using the perspective of the speaker as the basis that motivates the communicative intent of the speaker when selecting a target form, then you get um, a much more productive way of bringing that to class. So in the perspective, what we have to take into account is, first of all, the moment of enunciation. So the speaker is the center and it is the builder of meaning. So you're going to have the moment of enunciation of the narration in the past tense by the speaker as one factor that will determine which tense will be used. Um, you will have to have the perspective or you have to take into account the perspective of the speaker of what the duration of every action is within that narrative and how that fits um, with the story that is being told. Also within perspective, you're going to have temporal relevance that's assigned by the speaker. So if you have a narration, you're going to have background information and main information. So what kind of relevance does the uh, speaker assign to every tense will determine imperfect or preterite in Spanish. And in this temporal relevance, since we are working with the time and space uh, metaphor, we're going to talk about proximity and distance. So that's, uh, that's how you operationalize the perspective um, to sort of try and um, look for the good explanation to bring to the classroom and to the students. And then in the theory, there is much talk about bounded and unbounded um, actions that are conveyed by each tense and that account actually for aspect, which is in the end what will be your prototype in uh, defining what the imperfect is and what the preterite is. So bounded and unbounded actions are, they talk about limitations but like literal limitations. And when you talk about an action, an unbounded action is an action that doesn't have limits. That is not considered as being um, with a clear ending and a clear beginning. Um, whereas bounded actions <coughs> are actions that have limitations and therefore the aspectual difference will be conveyed by these uh, boundaries that you choose to give to the action that you uh, convey in either preterite or imperfect. So uh, from the theoretical perspective, tense would be imperfect, tense would be preterite. So you have time and aspect. And by time, you're going to operationalize with space. So the metaphor will apply for time uh, and also for aspect, but mostly for time. So I put an asterisk here in time because some of you might be thinking, OK, if I say that the imperfect uh, operationalize time in terms of proximity, um, somebody might say, yeah, but what kind of proximity? Because it is a past tense. Um, so they're both distant from the speaker. Uh, but as we will see when I show you what the prototype that the students saw in the classroom looks like, then you'll see what I mean. So that's why there's a little asterisk as a call for attention here. So the imperfect will be in terms of time and space, in terms of distance, will be more proximal to the speaker um, and to the speaker's perspective and we'll present an action that's bounded, unbounded, I'm sorry. Uh, we'll present an action that's unbounded, so open-ended. And the preterite, on the, on the other hand, will conceptualize time as being distant. Um, so time is space, then space is distant in this case. And for the action, for the aspect, it will be a bounded action, so it will be a closed-off um, action. Okay. 
So that is the theoretical perspective on the prototype. But you can't take this to class. Um, you can't explain this to students because it's not user friendly, uh, so to speak. So how do we how do we bridge the gap between the theory and the pedagogy? Sort of like this. Um, first of all, there's color coding, which is input enhancement, which you know really works. Um, but uh, this is not class yet. This is the middle step. So what, I, what am I doing here? I am going to go from a cognitive prototype that we saw there to a operational prototype, which I can operate with in the classroom. That's what I mean. That's what I mean by operational. So I will conceptualize time and proximity, which is the cognitive uh, prototype here, to an operational um, perspective prototype that will be talking about inside, and that's what proximity will mean. It is inside, and you will see in a minute what this means. Uh, and for aspects, since it is unbounded, we're going to use the word unfinished to talk with the students, because unfinished kind of means it doesn't have visual boundaries that we can account for. Um, for the case of the preterite, you have that the cognitive prototype is the distance. So the distance will mean, in terms of space, that it is outside. So the perspective of the speaker will be to consider an action from the outside. Um, and then, in terms of aspect, what's bounded will be considered as finished. So inside and outside, unfinished and finished, are words that students can understand better. And it's not that they can't take the cognitive prototype, but uh, it's not a cognitive linguistics class, it's a language class, and we need to move forward with the curriculum. So we need to present the students with a meta language that they can be uh, familiar with and that they can use and that they don't have to make a special you know, processing effort to understand and then move on in the foreign language. It's hard enough as it is. Um, so what does it look like in the classroom? We saw the first step, the theoretical part. We just saw the middle step. How do we make the theory um, more pedagogical? And now what do the students see? The students see this and this. This is how you make um, a prototype um, worthy. And I say the word worthy uh, with intention, worthy of a classroom. Um, you take the speaker, you take the action of the verb, so the mental space where the action takes place, and you put the speaker inside for the imperfect. So there's the first operativi operativization of the uh, prototype for perspective. The Proximity is inside. So the speaker is situated inside of the uh, mental space of the action of the verb and is seeing the action as unfolding. So unbounded, no limitations. There's no boundaries. There are no, it's, it's not finished. It's unfinished, which doesn't mean that it's an unfinished action. It just means that in the narrative, it's not relevant when that action finishes either because it doesn't matter or because something else is coming up that's going to be more important. So you present that action as an open-ended action. Whereas for the preterite, as you can imagine, then this is the distance. So this is the outside. The speaker is considered or is considering themselves as outside of the mental space where the action um, takes place. So that's where that distance is operationalized for the classroom. And then the action of the verb, uh, that bounded, um, prototype here is presented as finished. So there is a beginning, there is a duration of the, of the action, and then the action is finished. Um, so in traditional instruction or regular instruction, we at conferences um, on this topic, we talk a lot about what is traditional instruction anymore. You know, how can you define traditional instruction? It's like uh, the communicative approach. How do you define those things? You know, those are such uh, used up concepts that it's hard uh, to come up with like a real definition of what they are anymore. Um, so let's say classical for the sake of uh, difference. Um, so classical instruction, what it does is present a lot of uses. It presents the form, um, how tenses are formed, how are they conjugated, what do they mean, and then what are the discursive uses. So the students never get to see any common thread between tenses, and since each one of them has their temporal markers assigned, um, students see, first of all, no common thread on the discursive uses of each tense, and they don't. They, we see them in contrast in the classroom, but they don't really see a contrast. They just see this and this. They see them separately. But here, um, the graphs are more or less the same, 
it is the uh, the position of the speaker and the duration of the action. So it's very limited. It kind of takes the entire amount of information and concentrates it in two, only two uh, amounts of information. One is where are you as a speaker? What's your perspective? And second of all, what kind of action are you describing? Are you describing an open-ended action or a finished action? Do you want your narration to move forward or do you want your narration to stay in place? And how do you represent that? And when you write a composition, as we were talking earlier this morning, um, when you have the students write an essay, um, what do they mean? Are they writing a story and are you reading the story that they're writing? Or are they writing something and you're reading something else? So um, instruction with these things is necessary and making the students aware of your, what's your communicative intent. And based on that communicative intent, you're going to choose one or the other and have me in mind when you write your essay or your story or you tell us what you did last weekend. Um, so this is much more productive. And this is something the students can really work with. And this is what we presented to them um, in the empirical study that we did. Um, Besides the empirical study, this is how we teach um, in our language program at Columbia anyway. So um, it was semi, semi easy uh, to create an empirical study on something that we were already doing. So um, in the, within the, the study itself, what are the research questions and hypotheses that we had? Um, the first question we had, what is the relative effectiveness of, a, of an approach, an instructional approach based on cognitive linguistics as faced with a traditional approach, aka classical approach, meaning those discursive uses and temporal markers. In the initial acquisition of the Spanish aspect distinction as measured in interpretation abilities. So how can, the, are the students going to recognize the uh, imperfect or the predicate and know what they mean? Um, and for by initial acquisition of Spanish aspect distinction, we mean elementary two. So our hypothesis for this and with, um, that input enhancement, uh, you probably can see what we obtained <laughs> already. So our initial hy or our hypothesis to that initial question was the cognitive linguistics-based approach will be better, basically. Um, will outperform the traditional approach in the initial acquisition in interpretation abilities. So in reading and recognition, cognitive linguistics ap um, approach and group will be better than the traditional group. Okay. Not, it's not entirely bad news, but uh, it's not what we had set out to obtain. Uh, the second research question, however, was what is, it's the same question, I'm not going to read it again because it gets, uh, it's very technical. Um, so for production abilities. So first of all, they're going to recognize and second of all, they're going to produce. So what is the uh, effectiveness of each um, approach to teaching? So we have green here, which is better news. Um, our hypothesis was, yes, cognitive linguistics groups will do better, or group will do better than the traditional group, and of course, better than the, cog uh, the control group, the baseline group. So um, we did this in the spring of 2016. So this was last year, and uh, um, Jimena already knows the ending to this, uh, to this one story because I presented it at the UK CLC. Uh, conference, but we had an initial pool of 131, which sounds like a lot, but ended up being just 56, uh, which is the woe of um, you know empirical research. Um, so we had beginners, meaning elementary two in the case of Columbia, um, 45, 45, and 41 uh, students. They were uh, they were just randomly selected based on the groups where they were, uh, you know, their sections, their classrooms, no. <coughs> So the selection criteria that ended up having only 56, uh, 21, 17, and 18 was, first of all, attendance, because this was a two-week study. And if you're not there for one session, you're out. And uh, <clears throat> why did you miss class that day, right? Um, in my dissertation, it was eight months. So I started with, I think, 300 and something and ended up with 81. Uh, yes. And that was, and I think that was a lot for eight months. It was an entire um, semester and, and year, academic year. So second of all, contact with Spanish outside the study. This is New York City we're talking about. This is NYC. Um, Spanish is everywhere. So how much contact do they have? And second of all, do they know other Romance languages? Because, you know, in New York, everyone is there. 
So the odds that they speak French or that they speak Italian or that, you know, they have a lot of friends in Washington Heights, uh, the neighborhood that's uh, pretty much Dominican, uh, you know, that had to be uh, measured. So a lot of students were eliminated because of that. And then they scored really well. Um, so on the pre-test score that had 10 points, if they had six or more, they were out. So sadly, 56 in the end, but okay, you know, that works. So we had three, four stages, actually, if you can't state zero, where um, on day one, students and the teachers only saw the morphology of the preterite and the imperfect. So what are they, uh, how do you conjugate them, like regular verbs, irregular verbs, and that was all. Um, on day one, they had the pretest, and that was all, and then moved on with class. So classes are 75 minutes. Um, so for the first class, 50 minutes. For the second class, just 20 minutes. And for the second and you know, second, third, and fourth classes, they had instruction in the target uh, in the target group. So traditional instruction, I'll tell you what they did, and cognitive linguistics, they did something else. Uh, and then on on the fourth day, uh, just a post test, right after right after the final day of the instruction, they did the second po first post test. Um, control group did nothing but the tests and stress about it, of course, because they were like, it's not gonna be. I don't know what this is. <laughs> You're just a control group. You're okay. Um, they were working on comparative uh, structure, so uh, better than, taller than. So uh, for stage zero, that uh, morphology of the of the tenses, it was uh, you know what they looked like and some practice activities. And for the instruction, they had the introduction, the theoretical introduction to the target form and practice activities. So for this, even though everything was perfectly controlled so that everyone did the same and everyone worked with the same words and the same uh, teaching materials, what we did uh, was adapt what we had. So we worked with a um, task-based approach, a textbook called Gente, and then we have the Gramatica Basica, the basic students, basic student grammar of Spanish, I think it's called in English, um, which has to do with cognitive linguistics. So the grammatical materials from the task-based group were very traditional, very classical, whereas the Gramatica Basica was very cognitive-based. So what we did was just, you know, with that prototype of operativization that I show you, we just um, transformed those materials from our language program into the research study um, and created two PowerPoints um, one for the traditional with all the temporal markers and one for the cognitive with the two prototypes that you saw. But the examples in both uh, were the same. And the language used in both were the same. And we decided to go with English, uh, second language acquisition, psycholinguistics, processing resources, everything. So we wanted to make sure um, that not understanding the target language would be a big uh, control variable in a research study like this. Um, so pre-test and post-test, the assessment was paper and pencil tasks. So very, very classical, where uh, we worked with the textbook and uh, we included following the Kaiser's work um, on vocabulary and processing and everything. So we gave them appendixes on vocabulary and verbal morphology. We wanted the students only to be able to focus on imperfecto or preterito. Um, so everything else was controlled for. Everything else was English, and it was given to them. Uh, and then we had an interpretation task, which was a grammatically, uh, grammaticality judgment task. You know, same old, same thing as always. Um, yeah. And for the production tasks, just a blank, right? So what do they look like here? And this is again from their own textbook. We just adapted it for uh, the research study, but. Read the following text carefully and decide whether the bolded verbs are correct or not. Circle the ones that are incorrect. And for the production task, um, I give you the, uh, the sentences, I give you the infinitive, and then you conjugate either or. Um, and I'm going to give you in your appendix, you have comenzó and comenzaba. And then you select the one uh, that you need. And you don't have to uh, spend time trying to figure out how to conjugate the verb. So. Let's see results. So it was it was red, but it was it wasn't bad. The only thing is that there was no statistical difference between the traditional group and the cognitive group. So they both did really well. Period. And of course, they both did a lot better than the control group, which had done nothing but the tests. 
And of course, uh, there was no effect. You know, the instruction is effective, meaning if the control group learns nothing, which is what happened, uh, then the the differences between um, instructional groups will be meaningful. So we found that there was no statistical difference for interpretation, for recognition of the tenses, they both did as well. We have theories as to why this is that, of course, uh, you know, fit our bill. Uh, but we think they're pretty accurate, too. So uh, we're just not making this up. Um, so our green results, which I was very excited about, because production, um, writing is a lot harder than recognizing and interpreting and reading. Uh, you have to have an active retrieval of the uh, target form. And even if you have it on the, on the sheet of paper, what it looks like, you still have to come up and think of it. So for here, we did see uh, an advantage of the cognitive linguistic group versus the traditional group. And of course, a lot better uh, than the control group that learned nothing. So the production task was in the, indeed better. So that means that students really did understand it a little bit better. Um, so let's see. Despite the study being, you know, small scale, 131 to 56, um, overall, the results really show a superiority of the cognitive linguistics um, approach to language teaching in aspectual differences. Um, and this is, we're talking about a very complex area of Spanish as a foreign language. Um, so what happens with the traditional approach uh, or the classical approach? There were learning gains in both tasks. Well. Of course, all methods work to some extent, and we're not saying ever that the traditional approach doesn't work. I learned English with a traditional approach, and here I am, and I'm okay. Uh, and I'm not traumatized or anything, and I did pretty well. So um, every instructional method works, and it's okay. Um, so they had learning gains in the traditional approach? Yes, we were counting on that. But we also think that they equal the cognitive group and interpretation because of two things that they had to their advantage. One of them was that we assigned homework on the tenses. So we thought that might have been a mistake, um, that the students would review what they had learned at home by themselves, and you can't control for that. So uh, you know, we think that was an, you know, an oversight, live and learn, uh, replicate. So, and also, more and more and more important than ever, Temporal markers were present in their instruction. The cognitive linguistics groups had, had no temporal markers included at all in their, instructor, in their instruction. But the tasks from, were from the traditional uh, textbook, and they did include these temporal markers. So we think that they performed as well than the cognitive group because they could recognize. They had extra input. And actually, it is pretty good of the cognitive group to do as well as the traditional group for the task, the interpretation task, where temporal markers were included. Um, so as I said, it's not as bad. It's actually pretty good. And for the cognitive approach, they had learning gains in both tasks. They had superior results in production. And that means you know, that it's actually more, um, it's more challenging. It's more difficult. So it is better. The students were able to do an active retrieval of target forms and make an informed foreign meaning connection. Um, and that is the really good news that we have. So yes, this is what, this is, as far as you know, Jimena, this is what you uh, got in, uh, in the, at the UK CLC last uh, year. And I included here the limitations because these limitations inform the replication that we just did. We just finished a month ago with the replication. So for external validity, the reduced size. You cannot, of course, in, in uh, applied linguistics, we all know we have to say that you cannot generalize the results to every single population of English learners or Spanish learners, right? Um, so, the, you know, how can results be generalized when you only have 56? They don't they're not representative, right? Um, for the internal validity, the temporal markers, and that was important, and we thought that was very important to take into account for a possible replication, and because you know the temporal markers were also in the assessment and they were absent for the cognitive linguistics group, um, we think that actually this group was disfavored in the empirical study. And actually, pretty good that it really did as well as the traditional and then outperformed in production. 
Um, also, for the homework assignments, um, we couldn't control for that, so how did that impact students' learning in both groups? Um, and for the scope of the study, we only had one post-test immediate after the second day of instruction, and assessment instruments, you know, we're always doing grammaticality judgment tasks, and we're always doing blanks, because that is the best way to um, get results from the students. You do anything else, and students are more or less free to do what they want, and they will automatically avoid the target forms. And they will write entire essays without using the target mm -hmm. form. Um, so it is very hard to select other tasks, but you know, how are the, the results, how can they be different if you do something else? So this is what based off the uh, new replication that we did. Um, this is what I said, how can results be generalized? Okay, our initial pool this time is 224. We took everyone, <laughs> all sections of elementary two this semester, all of them participated. So our colleagues were completely ambushed and we sat them all down and said, this is what it is. You guys are gonna do the cognitive group. You guys are gonna be traditional, I'm sorry. And you guys are gonna be the control, the control group. So don't worry about it, you just have to give them the tests. And please tell them not to guess. So this is our initial pool. There's an asterisk there because I don't know how many we have. This just finished. So we are, as we speak, uh, counting tests <laughs> and eliminating subjects. Um, so here we go. What else can we say? In, uh, internal validity, those temporal markers, what have we done this time? None. Temporal markers are out of the assessment. They are in the instruction for a traditional group, but they're no, nowhere to be found in the pre-test and post-test. Um, and our new assessment has very untraditional temporal combinations, and I will uh, talk about that in a second. The homework assignment, done, out. No homework assignment on the target form. We gave them enough homework on other things to keep them distracted, and, and we said specifically, do not review this in class, because students were aware that they were participating in a study because they had to sign a consent form because um, the ethics uh, office and the ethics committee so wills it. So there we go. The Hawthorne effect of awareness of the study, you know, that's out of the question for this case, right? Um, so the factors that restricted the scope of the study, okay, so they did one post-test right after the instruction, so what? Okay, so we have two. Now, we did one immediate right after the second day of instruction, but two weeks later, we did another one. And for that, and we're very, both of us, my colleague and I, are very grateful to our colleagues because they let us change the entire um, um, scope and sequence of elementary two so that we could fit the second delayed post-test. So uh, instead of doing units five, six, seven, and eight, they did uh, five, six, eight, seven, a little bit of five again, and uh, you know they were really good game for this. And so here we go. Other types of tasks. What can you do that's not grammaticality, judgment, or a blank for production? So since we went to the UKCLC and we talked there and we went, we presented this at the Second Language Research Forum uh, that took place at Teachers College in New York City last September, and we also presented this at the uh, Asociación Española de Lingüística Cognitiva, the conference of the Spanish Association of Cognitive Linguistics in Madrid in October. Um, we were like, okay, let's, you know, let's talk about this. What can we do? So we have chosen pedagogical translation as an option. So what did we do? We took a very popular song by Joaquin Sabina. Um, that's called Y nos dieron las diez y las once, right? Very, very romantic, very cool song all in the imperfect and the preterite. And what we did was take the song. We never told the students it was a song until the end um, of the entire study because we used the same song for the pretest and the post-test. So um, we divided the song in two. And for the pretest, they did one part. For the post-test, they did the next part. And for the so we told them that the assessment was going to be a story. And we translated the song into English, and the students had both. Um, the translation in English first, and then the, trans the, the original version in Spanish, and we gave them the verse and the appendixes for vocabulary, everything was the same, and then the students need to decide uh, whether imperfect or preterite are to be used. I have no idea what came out of that. I haven't analyzed the results yet. I'm very excited. So 
if any of you are going to the uh, International Cognitive Linguistics Conference in Estonia this summer, then um, that will be where the big results will be revealed. Um, but I'm hopeful. Uh, this was a risky, very risky move, we think, but there's nothing that has been done that we know of in applied linguistics that doesn't involve those two types of tasks. So what's going to happen here? So this is what we've done, and this is where we are. Good news then for cognitive linguistics approaches to Spanish um, L2 instruction. You know, we're on the right track, we think. Our, uh, this, is, this is encouraging. Um, the replication that was in the works for spring uh, is done, and now the analysis needs to begin. And quickly, too, because my colleague is very much pregnant. And uh, she's going to do the um, empirical uh, statistic analysis of the results, so she better, you know, we better get on it. And uh, we think, of course, that more studies need to be done to keep confirming these learning benefits. But other than that, we just think we are moving on the right track. And this is all I have for now. Thank you so much for your very patient attention.